morning that there's uh, basically three kinds of people. There are early people, there are on-time people, and there are late people relative to church. We are in the last camp in our family. We are the late people. What I realized today is that when you're a late person, you show up late. Um, no matter how hard you try, it seems like you show up late. You always feel embarrassed and alone. Well, I'm not alone. I've seen other late people come in today. So you're my tribe. All you know, you know who you are. You've been late. So uh, today's St. Patrick's Day, right? Um, but unfortunately, we have a leprechaun-free uh, message today. So there will be no leprechauns today. I'm sorry to disappoint you. But we are going to kind of jump into the deep end of the swimming pool. I don't know if you're the kind of person who likes when you go swimming in a swimming pool, you like to kind of ease your way in from the shallow end and slowly get acclimated, or you like to cannonball in the deep end. We're going to cannonball today. So just, just as a warning for you easier people, today is a cannonball day. So... Uh, we, as Scotty mentioned, and he'll be back next week, by the way. Don't you miss him? I do. Um, I'll be so grateful when he, when he comes back. Um, we are in the middle of this series on Philippians, and uh, today we're going to take a deep dive into Philippians 3, which I think has embedded in it um, some of uh, the, the greatest words that any human being has ever spoken are embedded in Philippians 3. So how's that for overhype? But we're going to get to that place in Philippians 3 where everything in human history turns on what Paul is trying to say. And just as a, like a 60-second uh, recap of what, where we're at right now in this whole Philippians uh, series, just remember, Paul is chained up in a prison, a Roman prison right now. Um, it's a dark, dank, hopeless place. And compounding that hopelessness is that he's chained to a Roman soldier 24-7. So he has no way of getting out. He doesn't even know if he'll ever get out or if he's going to be executed. That thing is just sitting over him. Meanwhile, he decides to write a letter to the followers of Jesus in Philippi, which is in Macedonia, which is in today's Greece. And he planted this church about 12 years prior, right? So he's had a long, um, deep relationship with the people he's writing to. He's not actually writing the letter, though. He's actually dictating the letter um, because he's chained up in a Roman prison to a soldier. Uh, the reason he's writing the letter is that there are some things happening back there in Philippi that are troubling him. So in addition to all of his other physical stuff that he's got going on and the hopelessness that would hang over him, he's got this worry uh, assaulting him that there are people back there in Philippi that are starting to plant seeds of doubt and deception in the community that he planted. And he's starting to hear word back that there's, uh, you know, fake news happening back there in Philippi. People spreading lies about things that he can't do anything about because he can't leave and go confront the people who are saying these lies. So that's a little bit of an on-ramp. Let's dive right into Philippians 3. Um, he starts off in this portion of his letter um, pointing his finger directly at the people who are responsible for planning this deception. So it starts out in, <clears throat> excuse me, in verse 2. He says, watch out for those dogs. So Paul doesn't mince words. <laughs> watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. So what is Paul saying here when he refers to these people who are dogs and he's concerned about the deception they're planting in this community he planted? He's, he's referencing that these people are saying you have to be circumcised to be considered good, right? You have to follow the Jewish law, even though Jesus has come and he has fulfilled the law. So Paul has very pointedly said all along, you don't have to be circumcised anymore because Jesus will do that in your spirit now. You don't have to perform some kind of outward show of loyalty and obedience and goodness in order to be considered good anymore. And I'm frustrated that these people are replanting this wrong belief in you. So um, what Paul's really going after is something that's almost eternal in humanity. He's going after our point system for determining who's good and who's bad, right? So the point system is embedded deep in our souls. It's our default setting. It's the reason why, for example, when something really hard happens to a really good person, we often say, why does something so hard have to happen to a good person? We're essentially outing the fact that we've ingested the point system into our souls, which says, if people are good enough, that means they should qualify to not have terrible things happen to them. Terrible things should only happen to really bad people. 
And then we start to consider, well, how much good do you have to be before you get out of the bad stuff? So um, my family and I started watching a, a show called The Good Place about three weeks ago. How many of you have watched The Good Place? Raise your hand. So this is a comedy uh, um, that's been on for three seasons now. I never paid any attention to it, but a few weeks ago, um, a friend of mine who I really respect said, Rick, you just wired the way you are. You have got to watch The Good Place. It's my favorite show. I said, yeah, we don't watch a lot of TV in our house, so I'll think about it. And then another gal across the hallway heard him talking about The Good Place and came over into our area to say, oh, The Good Place is my favorite show. Rick, you've got to watch it. And I said, okay, okay, two's enough. <laughs> so uh, it's on Netflix now. So my wife and I said, we'll watch the first episode and then we'll see. So we watched the first episode and two days later we had watched the whole season one <laughs> of the show. So um, the basic premise of this show is uh, Kristen Bell plays a woman who wakes up in some kind of strange waiting room and she's invited into another um, comfortable, brightly lit office by a very tall man, very distinguished looking, played by Ted Danson. His name is Michael in the show. And uh, he invites her into his office, and she's, she doesn't know where she is. So she says, where am I? And he said, well, um, the bad news is that you're dead. <laughs> you died, and I can tell you how you died if you want to know, but you're dead. And, but the good news is you ended up in the good place. And she's kind of shocked by this news because she knows that, I mean, she even describes herself as not a good person. <laughs> in fact, she has a rotten history of doing rotten things throughout her whole life. So she's sitting there listening to this guy say, you are a good enough person to be in the good place. And she's thinking, oh, they made a mistake. I got to fake my way through here because I don't want to go to the bad place. So the whole show is premised on her understanding that she shouldn't really be there. So in the, the first scene of the first show, Michael, played by Ted Danson, is talking to, kind of giving an orientation to all the people who have just entered the good place. So they're kind of gathered on this hillside, and he's giving them an orientation about why they ended up in the good place, and he's explaining the point system. So I want you to pay close attention to his explanation of the point system. It's the most brilliant description of it I've ever seen. So let's watch. Okay. <laughs> so let's talk about this for a second, and by talk about it, I mean uh, all of us. So... What are some potential downsides to the point system that you just saw? And by the way, I love if you, I've watched this many times now, so now I can pick out some of the, the, good, the good and the bad uh, points that are added to your algorithm. One, one of the good ones was um, found a hermit crab a new shell was a good one. I loved, I just saw one there that uh, uh, be the commissioner of the NFL was a, ma a major downside on the bad side. So... <laughs> Uh, but what are some, some of the potential downsides for the point system? Let me hear what you think. It's, what do you mean a perfect system? It's a perfect system. Yeah. And, and that can, it, the more you think about, wow, it's a perfect system, that can be a good thing, but mostly it would be a bad thing for most of us, right? <laughs> what are some other downsides to the point system that you can think of? There's not a right answer I'm looking for here. We're just brainstorming. What's that? It's not biblical. Yeah, we'll uh, dive into that in a minute. It's relative. Yeah, so the, you don't really know what, how, how good a good thing is or how bad a bad thing is. Somehow the algorithm is deciding that. Yeah. What else? Yeah. They get it wrong. They get it wrong sometimes. sometimes. Sometimes, hey, did you know that algorithms are wrong sometimes? <laughs> yeah. So if you think about, though, living under this kind of system, I was talking to my daughter, Emma, who just turned 16 and got her driver's license, and she's seen this scene, and she turned to me and she said, Dad, that is just like taking my driver's tests. And I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, I had this guy sitting next to me watching everything I did, and if I didn't do everything perfectly, I wasn't going to get my license. So she's starting to describe what living under the point system might be like if we took it to its nth degree. By the way, I'm going to give a spoiler alert about this show right now. So if you want to watch this show and you've never seen it, I'm going to whisper the spoiler alert. So you just need to plug your ears for a second. I'm totally serious. I'm going to spoil some of the show. So if you don't want that to happen, close your ears. All right, the rest of you. So it, they, you find out at the, the end of season one that demons have created the point system. 
and that Michael, who you saw there, is actually not a good spiritual being. He's a demon. <laughs> okay, you can unplock your ears now. So the twist I just told everybody that you didn't hear, you get to experience yourself, and it will hit you like a truck when you're watching this show. The, the point is that the point system is not only uh, like this. It's, it's really they, they've kind of figured out how to actually portray what we on a default way think inside. Um, it is ubiquitous. It has been with us for, since the dawn of time. It is defaulted into our system. Even when we say it's not right or not biblical, we still functionally operate as if goodness and badness on this scale is the way things are decided. So Paul, back to Paul. Here's what he says uh, next in Philippians 3. So well, let me see where we stopped here. So he says, we rely on Christ Jesus and what he's done for us. We put no confidence in human effort, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. So he's saying, we're not going to put confidence in the point system, but let's just take this example just for a second. If we were going to live in the point system, I would be at the top of the pyramid. Let's take a look at what Paul points to um, relative to his, uh, his algorithm. So he was circumcised at eight days old, which is <clears throat> part of what God commands good Jewish families to make sure their sons are circumcised on exactly the eighth day he was. He's a pure-blooded Jew. There's no impurity in his bloodline. And he's from the tribe of Benjamin, one of the original 12. He's a Hebrew of Hebrews, he's trying to say. He's a Pharisee, which is basically a professional good person. He's not only a professional good person, he says at the end of this stretch, and I have perfectly kept the law. I have never messed up in the law. And he's zealous, not just in his words, but he's carried it out with actions. He's actually dragged Christians into prison and killed them at times because he believes it's a cult. So he didn't just say, hey, that's a cult. He did something about it. In every way, Paul is saying, I am at the top of the point system. And then the next thing he says is profound. This is what I think is the most important words ever said in our <clears throat> human history. Again, I know it's overhype, but you'll see what I mean in a second. Here's what Paul says after building his case as being the one person who's at the top of the point system who could benefit from that system continuing because he He's done perfectly at it. So here's what he says after that. Uh, here we go. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of what? Of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. Here's, here's the, the, the tipping point of history, I think, this next line. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ, for God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. So here Paul is essentially saying, the point system that I've been so good at, uh, it is worthless to me. It, th those metrics don't matter to me anymore. I had my own moment, uh, kind of Paul moment, a couple of years ago. I was at a gathering in the Colorado mountains called the Simply Jesus Gathering that a friend of mine named Carl Madera started about six or seven years ago. Every year I go to speak at this gathering. It's in this idyllic setting. It, it's under this huge enclosure that's has the, no walls on the side, so you just get to experience the mountain air. And there was about 500 people that come to this e every summer. And uh, on the first night uh, a couple years ago, Carl Medeiros, my friend, was up on, in the front saying, at, at, when we end tonight's evening session, we're going to gather around the campfire that's just to the side of where we're meeting. Anyone who wants to come and hang out and sing a little bit. Um, well, we have Brad Corrigan who's going to play guitar at the campfire tonight. And I kind of sat bolt upright in my seat because I know Brad Corrigan. And I thought, oh my gosh, I didn't know he was here. Brad Corrigan is one of three members of a band called Dispatch. Now, probably most of you haven't heard of Dispatch, but they are uh, the most successful, most popular independent band in history. Um, about eight years ago, when Dispatch was going to break up, 
they had a farewell concert in Boston outside, and they attracted 110,000 people to their concert. They still come to Red Rocks pretty much every summer, and they sell out three nights in a row. They are a hugely popular band around the world. And Carl got Brad Corrigan to come to the mountains near Vail for the only one reason to play guitar for about an hour around the campfire. I thought, oh my gosh. So uh, I went uh, outside of the campfire. Brad had started to play. There was a few people gathered around the campfire, but they weren't really listening to Brad play. They were just talking because they didn't know who Brad Corrigan was, right? Um, he's just campfire guitar guy. So Brad's playing. I'm mesmerized by what he's doing because he's so good. But most people are just talking. But that did not affect what Brad was doing. He just played with his whole heart. And over the course of that hour, people slowly started to pay attention to what he was doing and leaned in. They still didn't know who he was. So I had to go, I had to, go to bed that night. So I'm walking in the dark across a field to where my car is. And the campfire is about 50 feet away from me. And Jesus just stops me in my tracks. I said, Rick, stop. I want to talk to you for a second. So I was like a little child. What do you want to say, Jesus? And he said, I want you to never forget what happened tonight. And I said, what do you mean? Well, what was flooding into my head is that I'm an author. I've written about three dozen books. And when you're an author or an artist or anything that you do, where you've practiced and tried to hone what you're doing, you have your own point system, right? In my world, as an author, the point system is how many books you know, people buy from you. Well, my books have always been what I would call generously, maybe, um, marginally successful. So that's something that's on my mind a lot, right? Maybe whatever it is for you, whatever your point system, it's on your mind a lot. You're always wishing or hoping or working to do better at what you're doing, and it rivets your attention on your own personal metrics, whatever they are. So in this moment, in the dark, Jesus stops me and says, I want you to pay attention to what Brad did tonight. And I said, tell me more. And Jesus said to me, um, remember the parable of the 99 and the one sheep. The point of that parable is that I left behind, the good shepherd leaves behind the 99 on the hill to go after the one caught in the brambles. What Brad did tonight was go after the ones. He did not care about the crowd. He only cared if even one person listened to what he was doing. That was enough for him. Rick, this is my heart. And if you want my heart, because that's why I told that parable to describe my heart. If you want my heart, that's the kind of heart you're going to have to want. And in that moment, my default point system just, sh I shed it like a skin, just dropped around me, started crying in the middle of the field. And I said, I do want your heart, Jesus. I want the kind of heart that only is concerned about going after the ones. Well, what he was really doing in the kindest, most tender way was destroying my metrics. He was putting my metrics, my point system, in light of his own heart. And I believe this is what's happened to Paul as well. Paul, when he talks about um, the, the, how he's at the top of the pyramid of the point system, and he uses this strong language that he counts it all worthless, this highlighted place is the important place to, to, to pay attention. For his sake, I've discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage, so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. So in the middle of that uh, sentence, he says, I count it all as garbage. So I looked up the word garbage. So because we want to be accurate about what words were originally used that were now translated into, in this case, garbage, the, the root word of garbage is scubulon. That's the word Paul actually used. Now, why, uh, why he used that word is quite important to understand. It, it is translated garbage or rubbish by most contemporary translations, but that isn't what the word means. And the reason it's translated garbage or rubbish is because you can't put the word that Paul actually used translated into the Bible. It would be offensive. The word means excrement, and actually it's stronger than that. It's a word that starts with S and is followed by three letters. That's actually what Paul said. He didn't say, I have some distaste for my, my old metric system, my old point system, all that stuff I told you now doesn't really matter to me that much. No, he said, that stuff stinks to me. It's excrement to me. He used strong language because he was trying to convey how strongly he felt about this, not because he's some kind of super Christian. Something happened to Paul as he came to know Jesus 
that changed everything for him and made all that stuff literally seem like something he, that stunk to him. Well, what happened to Paul? I think in part what happened to Paul is that he slowed down and over a course of time got to know the heart of Jesus. So in his time, all of the stories we have of Jesus were orally transmitted, right? So he, there was no New Testament yet. So when Paul was knocked off his donkey and started following Jesus, he started hanging out with the disciples who were with Jesus and told him all the stories of Jesus. And the more stories he heard, and there was even more stories he heard than are in the Bible, the scripture writers tell us that Jesus did even more things that aren't in here, Paul started hearing the story after story of Jesus. And what he was hearing was not a new set of rules and principles and formulas to follow. He was hearing the heart of Jesus described through these stories. So he meets the man who's been sitting, uh, lying by the pool of Bethesda for 40 years, um, not able to get into the water soon enough to be healed. And he encounters this man who everybody knows why you're by the pool of Bethesda for 40 years. You want to be healed. And he walks up to this man and says, do you want to be healed? And the man says, yeah, I've been by the pool of Bethesda for 40 years. And then Jesus says, then pick up your mat and walk. These are the stories Paul was hearing, one after the other. What kind of heart says that, does that in that moment? Paul is being captured by the heart of Jesus. He's being captured by his presence, his essence. I thought of a way that we could maybe explore this a little bit. What does it mean to be captured by the presence, the essence of Jesus? I want to show you a clip from the film The Horse Whisperer. How many have seen The Horse Whisperer? Raise your hand. Okay, quite a few of you. Just real briefly, I want to kind of give you the context for those who haven't seen the film. It's a, it's a film about um, a, a mother, a cowboy, a daughter, and a horse. <laughs> so the daughter's name is Grace. She's a teenager, and uh, she lives in upstate New York. Her mom's a big-time magazine editor in New York City, and they're privileged and, and wealthy. And so she has her own horse, and so does her best friend, and they're out riding their horses one morning in the snow, their horses slide down a hill because it's too slippery and they kind of tumble out onto this logging road just as a logging truck is coming over the hill. The logging truck sees these two girls and their horses on the, on the road and tries to stop, but it's all covered in ice. So this logging truck is just sliding toward them. It slams into her friend and kills her instantly. And then Grace's horse, Pilgrim, faces the truck as it's sliding and tries to claw at the truck as it's heading toward Grace and slams into Pilgrim horribly injuring him, and the truck then runs over Grace's leg. Later, she has to have it amputated. She's a teenager now with an amputated leg. She drops out of school. She's depressed and suicidal and horribly broken, the same way her horse Pilgrim is. Pilgrim is rescued, but the vets say, we need to put this horse down. He's unrecoverable. When a horse has gone through this kind of trauma, they can never be ridden again. It would be best to put him down. But Grace and her mom, Annie, refuse to do that. It's too much sorrow. So in this, in this photo, you see Tom Booker and Annie McLean. Tom Booker is a cowboy played by Robert Redford in Montana, and he's known as the horse whisperer. He specializes in reclaiming damaged uh, horses that can't be reclaimed any other way. He just has an incredible way with horses. Annie, the mom, finds out about him and does something desperate. She puts Pilgrim in a horse trailer puts her daughter in the, in the truck, and they drive across the country to Montana to convince Tom Booker, Booker to work with Pilgrim, the horse, and reclaim the horse. So we're going to watch a scene a little bit longer than maybe you're used to of Tom Booker starting to work with Pilgrim, the horse. And I want you to pay attention to two things while we're watching. Pay attention to the horse and try to understand why does the horse act the way he does. And then pay attention to Tom Booker and ask yourself, why is what he's doing so powerful? All right, let's watch. All right, let's, uh, as we close off here today, let's talk about this for a second. Why is Pilgrim acting the way he is? And the other question there is, why does hurt cause us to push away those who want to help? So why is Pilgrim acting the way he is? Let's talk about it. Fear, I heard. What else? Fear of what, by the way? Who said fear? Yeah, fear of what? Fear of getting hurt again. Yeah, 
What else? Why is the horse acting the way he is? There's no right answer here, gang. What? No trust. Yeah. Because of the hurt and the pain, so trust has been damaged. Why else is Pilgrim acting the way he is? Anything else? Shame. Wow, that's a powerful word. It's funny how when you've been hurt and you're in pain, one of the primary strongest emotions is shame that you push away, right? And the pain and the brokenness in this horse mirrors the pain and brokenness in Grace, who's had her leg amputated, and even in her mom, who doesn't know how to save her daughter anymore. She's desperate. All of us have experienced hurt and pain in life. We are guaranteed to have our foundation of trust assaulted. In fact, our trust has been broken so many times by hurt and pain that we're not sure that we can ever really trust at a deep level. And here we have Pilgrim, who is a metaphor for us, pushing everything away. Um, And Tom Booker can't force Pilgrim into health, can't force Pilgrim into accepting touch from him, right? Here's what I'd like you to do real quick next is I want you to just turn to one other person next to you and talk about these two questions. Why does Tom Booker's approach with the horse work? What is it about what he's done that works with the horse? Another way of saying that is what exactly is he doing that's so powerful? Just turn to the person next to you and talk about that question for just a minute as we close. All right, I see. I hear the, the noise level going down a little bit. So why does Tom Booker do? Why is it so powerful? Why does it work with the horse? Let me hear what you talked about. What's that? The patience that he showed. And the patience was necessary because the horse was doing this, right? What else? Why does it work, what Tom Booker is doing? Yeah. He gives him a choice. Yeah, you don't have to come. I'm just inviting. Yes, what were you going to say? He say that again. Booker is meeting the horse where he's at, not pushing past it. What, why else does what he, the Tom Booker do? Why does it work? Eye to eye contact. So there's a he's trying to establish a relationship. Yeah. What else? Anything else? What's that? He never leaves. He's there all day, and he's not standing and waiting for Pilgrim. He's this. And here is Tom Booker as a metaphor for Jesus and Pilgrim a metaphor for us. He kneels and waits as long as it takes. For the horse, what's happening in the horse? The horse is saying, can I trust this guy? I've heard him already. I tried to push him away already. What is he doing here? Why is he here all day? Why is he kneeling? What? Tom Booker does is he is able to get over Pilgrim's lack of trust so that Pilgrim the horse can risk just a little bit of trust and come up to him and allow Tom Booker to touch the horse. And here's Paul's story. This is Paul's story. He's saying, all of that stuff that I used to live under is scubulon to me because I've now met the Jesus who did this as I got to know him. And as I saw his heart, his heart overcame my heart. So all that stuff that I was working so hard to be good at, none of that matters to me anymore. I just want his goodness. I want to know him and be one with him, Paul says, because he slowed down to experience his heart. And sometimes it takes that long because we've been hurt pretty bad. My encouragement to you today is to slow down and pay attention to the heart of Jesus because we typically don't. We think we know these stories. We think we know him, but we don't. Slow down.
pay better attention to his heart. Why does he do the things he does? When you do, his heart will do this to yours. It will capture you. And then all of the stuff, your metric system will fall away. Would you just close your eyes here as we close? We are the body of Christ. We are literally his extension in the world. And part of our role is to do what he does, pursue the way we just saw. So I want you to ask, simply ask Jesus to put a name on your heart right now. Just ask him to put a name in your head. Anyone you know. And now that you have that name, just simply like a child, ask Jesus, what does that person need? And then wait. And now all I ask you to do is just silently advocate, pursue on behalf of that person based on what Jesus has just shown you and pray silently for them for just a moment. Thank you.